Hi, Warren Whitlock here with another great guest. It's Brian Basilico. It's Bacon Brian, um, host of the Bacon Podcast and many other things. Uh, but Brian, I had you on today because you're doing something new, some a new book, a new idea. It's not bacon. It's well, it's part of the bacon system, which is my third book, but it's actually building upon it. And one of the things that I found is uh, my focus, my business has really begun to focus on B2B marketing, business to business. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I've been finding is with a lot of these B2B companies, they tend to have Vsauce, bright, shiny object syndrome. So mm -hmm. a lot of them will come to me and say, hey, we want to do SEO or we want to do email marketing. We want to do LinkedIn you know, whatever it is. Or, and what I find is that it reminds me a lot of going to Walmart or Costco. Okay. And you, you walk down the aisle and, and if you notice in Walmart or Costco, they have an entire aisle dedicated to toilet paper, right? And toilet paper is a commodity that everybody buys. I mean, why do they advertise toilet paper who is not using this stuff right mm -hmm. um but the key thing is is that there's different brands there's different you know uh, all kinds of different sizes and things of that nature and so let me give you just kind of a little basics behind the scenes of toilet paper so you understand the concept of toilet paper toilet paper was originally used in the sixth century by the chinese in the 14th century was the first time it was manufactured where humans were consuming it. In 1853 was when it was patented on a roll. The average size of toilet paper back about 10 years ago was four and a half inches by four and a half inches square. But just like everything else we buy in a grocery store, it shrunk. You know, you go buy an eight ounce can of something, it's now 5.5 .5 ounces, right? So toilet paper went down to 4.1 inches by 4.1 inches. And then somebody got the bright idea of shrinking it even more. And now it's 4.1 inches because it has to look good on your bathroom tissue paper holder, but it's only 3.7 inches tall. So it's about 20% shorter than it used to be. Now what they do is they take that same, same toilet paper they used to come in. The only thing you buy toilet paper in the old days was, was a four pack, right? You had all these different four packs. Now you get eight packs, 12 packs, 16 packs. And on the outside of it, it says that eight equals 32, 12 equals 96, 30 equals 120. You know, it's like they're trying to convince you that you're getting more value because it's like, hey, you know, I'm getting 120 rolls of toilet paper now for whatever. Here's the bottom line. The average cost of toilet paper is 85 cents. Most of those mega rolls cost you $1.20 and you're getting less toilet paper. The average person uses 57 sheets a day. Men obviously use less than women. But the bottom line is most people will bundle up the same amount of sheets, right? Whether it was four and a half inches or 3.7 inches. So the bottom line is they've convinced you that you're getting more for your money because they put this graphic on the outside of this and they're selling you these mega big bundles of mega rolls, okay? That's the way that a lot of companies treat marketing. And that's what toilet paper math is about. So... Mm -hmm. You know, a clear example of that is I hear people say all the time, I need more traffic to my website. Well, who doesn't need more traffic to their website, right? Now, Warren, what if I told you I could get you a million visitors for $500 right now? Would you be interested in that? No. <laughs> well, I know you wouldn't because you're smart <laughs> enough to know the difference. <laughs> yeah, I, I wouldn't. But yeah, but you're right. People would be saying, where is that? I mean, right. I've seen I've seen. Uh, uh, we've got 5 million email addresses on a CD back in the right. 90s. And you just knew that, you know, whatever that was, was garbage because, you know, they made more than one CD, um, you know, for right. one thing. I uh, made a lot. And uh, and where did you get them from? It was, you know, it was before some of the spam laws. Uh, but it's still done like that. You're right, man. I, I went on a cruise with marketers once and went mm -hmm. to hang out at Midnight Pizza and decided I would be helping answering questions. And the first guy that came up to me wanted to know how to get more traffic. And we decided, uh, after talking to him for a while, figure out what business he was in, he wasn't sure. 
he wanted to sell things to people that were, um, oh, Taekwondo and karate. That's martial arts. Mm -hmm. Martial arts, but it was only a certain type of karate uh, or whatever the, the thing was. But, you know, there's, there's like more than one form. And then there was still a potential of thousands of, of uh, places would buy because it, it was a how to run your business better book. Mm -hmm. uh, and obviously not in depth on marketing. Um, and uh, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, and so we got down to it and we said like, well, what you really need is more of these people and you don't necessarily need them coming to your website. Let's talk about your market first. So, and uh, ever since then, that just one just really sticks with me that this guy who would, you know, paid to go on a cruise and thought he had the greatest product. Turned out he didn't have proper rights to the product. He had all other, mm -hmm. a whole bunch of other problems. But he came up to me and said, the number one thing I need is more traffic. Right. Couldn't be farther from the truth. Well, now, I would very much like to meet 10 more people like my best customer. And that's exactly it. And that, that's the key. So if we go back to my original book, which is, it's not about you, it's about bacon. That original book is about relationship marketing. It's building mm -hmm. quality relationships. That's the cornerstone of everything. And, the, and what you just said is the most true thing I've ever heard. I'd rather spend 10 minutes with 10 people who know me than 10 seconds with 10,000 people who don't. And so having a relationship, understanding what's in it for each of you, and it may not even be something that's in it for you, but something that you can pay forward that eventually will come back as a referral or, you know, something in the long run is understanding the relationship process is number one. Number two is my third book, which is The Bacon System. Now, The Bacon System combines three core topics. Topic number one, having a killer website. You have to have a place to drive people to. And the content on that website has to be customer focused. There has to be a reason when people get to that website for them to take action, not just getting them to the website, but get them to do something. The second piece of that is analytics. Are you measuring where the traffic is coming from? How much time are they spending? What countries are they coming from? What pages are they going to? Where are they exiting? All of that stuff. The third piece is creating additional content, not only rewriting the pages on your website, but creating blogs, eBooks, videos, podcasts, whatever it is that are housed on your website that can drive the traffic to it. And ultimately what you're trying to do with all of that is create a conversation with those 10 people. In B2B, one customer can equate to 10,000, 100,000, million dollar sales. You wanna find those key influencers and start a relationship with them because it takes time. Nobody's gonna go to your website and risk their business and their job on you just by getting to that website. You have to start a conversation and be willing to invest the time to build a relationship. So toilet paper math is basically all the bright, shiny objects that people say that they can do. They can do email marketing, they can do content marketing, they can do SEO, they can do video, they can do Instagram ads, they can do LinkedIn ads. But the bottom line is if you do not have the complete system, if you don't understand all of the parts, chances are you're going to be blowing money you don't need to spend. Right. Well, you know, they, there's a common thing saying half of marketing is, uh, is wasted. I just don't know which half. And I don't believe that. I, <laughs> and I don't think it's better data alone. It's, it's like drilling down on something that works and doing it better and getting rid of the stuff that doesn't work. Mm -hmm. It's as simple as that. It's, it, it, I, I, uh, I just had a long discussion with somebody about our website with the biggest traffic and the most number of, of subscribers of anything I'm working on. Mm -hmm. And um, as I'm looking at some of the numbers, I'm asking some questions. I got a response of, well, you know, it's really not this, it's that, you know, and we're like, we're labeling it different. Yeah. I was looking at the EPC and it happened to be missing from a report. So I asked that question, but I'm really here today to ask about whether or not any of these things are working. Uh, you know, is the system working at all? And as I got looking at it, it just kept coming up different things we can do. Mm -hmm. But, you know, more important, let's get back to toilet paper. I love how you've taken 
the simplest of things. You did it with bacon. You're doing it now with toilet paper, which is, you know, currently in the news as being out. Mm -hmm. The thing that no one gets about toilet paper, that market is not going to change. Right. <laughs> it's going to grow when people grow. Uh, and in some cases, there's parts of the world where you know, they can add people to that. But the average person is not going to change from year to year how much toilet paper they buy. Exactly. 60 and, to 80 uh, rolls. Yeah. That's always it. Right. I mean, every person is 60 to 80 rolls. The more people yeah. you have. Right. So the, now it's a brand competition. That's all it is. Yeah. And the, the other thing about that uh, that is interesting, because you mentioned the, the big box stores, Costco's number one product overall is toilet paper. Mm -hmm. And because everybody buys it. And I... You know, I'm pretty good with math. I go walking through their toilet paper aisle, and I'm lost. And then I wind up getting the cheap stuff. And I had just a friend just uh, explained to me that uh, there's a few places in life where he doesn't want to have that kind of a problem. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, he says, I don't oh. want this stuff falling apart while I'm using it. Right. And he said, you know, I've instructed my family we're only getting the top brand. And uh, uh, and I got thinking about that. I go, have I been like over cheap or what uh, well, yeah and buying it to, but but <laughs> what we're doing is we're taking one thing toilet paper and talk just on and on i once right. did an interview with somebody we had talking about hockey i don't know why one of us brought it up we spent 15 minutes with analogies to hockey neither of us had ever been to a hockey game or had any interest <laughs> in hockey well um, i can guarantee both of us has used toilet paper yeah and, and I, well that's what else is brilliant <laughs> about what you do the, our friendship started because of bacon. Mm -hmm. You were that weird guy with the bacon. And uh, like, you know, I've watched your post and whatnot. Most people love doing something like here's another picture of bacon or what you were oh. doing to caption the picture. Uh, right. Some very simple things to uh, build an audience. And you've proven it, you know, uh, time and again. Um, right. And relationship. Because immediately when we got together, you you saw where we could do something. and and in depth we, we're doing these podcasts gosh you know i don't think you and i have ever uh you know done something where one of us handed money to the other no never and that's okay because not but i've made money from money. knowing you right um, because and i've been able to then network uh i love telling other people about your show i you know who knows how many listeners but i know guests uh you know i've sent over there and right uh, and, and vice uh, versa you know i've sent people to you and it's yeah. all about that's what relationships, there's all different kinds of capital. There's money capital, there's human capital, there's knowledge capital. I mean, we get those things from each other. Let me tell right. you a story about toilet paper, another one. And right. this is a true story. It's right along the lines of what you're talking about. So one day my wife says to me, we're at the toilet paper, stop on your way back from a meeting. Now, we live two minutes away from a shopping complex. In the shopping complex is a Walgreens and a Walmart, okay? So I come back from the meeting, I can either go into Walgreens and buy toilet paper and get in and out of there in a minute, or I can go into Walmart and spend a half hour because it's a much more of a pain in the butt. So I go into Walgreens and I walk in and I look at that and nice brand, which is their store brand is on sale. So I buy that, I bring it home, I hand it to my wife, she goes in the bathroom, she comes back out with the rolls, one missing, and hands me that and says, this sucks, go buy me this brand. And then she opened the garage door and pointed to my car and said, go. <laughs> so I tried to save some time. I tried to save some money. Okay. But then what happened is I had to go back over to the same place. I went into Walmart. It takes you 10 minutes to park your car. You have to go down 15 aisles. You have a thousand different brands of toilet paper. So you got to find the specific one that she asked for. Then you grab that. Then you walk back to the front of the store and you're standing in line behind people with full carts when you have one package of toilet paper in the self-checkout aisle because the ones that actually have people in them, the, the people checkout aisles are packed. So mm -hmm. you have one product, you're not going to stand behind people with 50,000 things in their cart. You're going to wait. And I finish that up. I pay for my one item and I go home and I hand it to my wife. Happy wife, happy life. But it took me a half hour to do something that I could have done very simply, you know, on Amazon if I had some forethought. And, and if I knew better and they sold that brand at Walgreens, I could, probably could have bought it there. Mm -hmm. So the, the lengths that we go to 
in order to satisfy a particular need in the consumer world is very different than it is in the B2B world because herein lies the thing. The worst thing that could have happened to me is I would have ended up sleeping on the couch. That's it, right. <laughs> you know? <laughs> but if somebody's buying toilet paper at a business and let's say the toilet paper doesn't get delivered or the toilet paper is four times what it should cost or the toilet paper, let's call it a widget, breaks and shuts the business down or they can't get deliveries from China because of you know the, the coronavirus or what happens. Mm -hmm. That is very different. What happens when things break down in a business is people lose their jobs. They lose their lifestyle. They lose a lot. So people are much more um, you know, anti-change. They're, they're more um, you know, opposed to change in the business world than they are in a consumer world. So you can get people to change brands on a dime. You know, put more commercials about Progressive over State Farm and sooner or later, Progressive is going to get more clients because mm -hmm. the name keeps coming in front of you. People will change and then next week they'll move to Allstate and, you know, they'll move wherever they want to. But in business, they don't move that fast. So you have to be a marketer who's willing to spend the time and the capital and the energy to build those long-term relationships with long-term ideas to convince people that you are the right product at the right time when they need you. Right. So that's yeah. the big difference in toilet paper and math is <laughs> you can get people to buy a bright, shiny object. And that's what a lot of people do in business is they'll buy SEO thinking they can get more traffic. They'll do email marketing without any plan or strategy behind it because they still think like a consumer. But the problem is, is the, the complications can lead to much dire consequences. Sure. There's a, well, there's a, you know, a whole nother thought I had on your, on your trip to Walgreens and, uh, and that, and it's, it's not about wives. I'll leave that. No, everything's <laughs> fine. Whatever you want, dear. Uh, no, but uh, brand, the, the brand loyalty thing there cost you and, it, and you're right to say, say it would cost uh, a business a lot more. Imagine you're paying an employee to do mm -hmm. this. Now you say, this is what we need. I've been in that situation. I can think of one time. One time I, I was thinking how great of a, a boss I was mm -hmm. and we were out of water. <laughs> and it, at that current time, there was a place making private labeled water, tasted good, and it was a half a block away and I had the largest vehicle and of course the, the credit to buy it and whatnot. And so I said, fine, it's like on the way to everywhere. I just stop by there, throw it in the car. When I get it to the business, I have somebody unload and we buy another 10 cases of water. Simple enough for my small business. And I let it run out and it took two or three days. I had employees taking extra breaks to run to 7-Eleven and buy a soda when I could have I could have had the problem solved for 30 seconds of my time or give the keys to, to my, my uh, SUV to somebody and let them go get it. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of easier ways to do this, but ours, and fortunately in a small business, you can kind of count some of those things, uh, what to do. And so I turned that around and started looking for where could I make things more convenient, not just for my customers, but for my employees, for everybody I dealt with, to make it a, a more default thing to do. Mm -hmm. And in marketing, I kind of look like I want to be the, their, uh, I want to be their get out of jail free card. So when my customer has a problem, I want him to call me. Uh, we used to say in the service business that we do anything with just with the same billing rate. You mm -hmm. need your fence painted? <laughs> sure. I'll get a couple of guys at $100 an hour, an hour out there and paint your fence. Well, no one's going to take that, but it's the attitude of we don't say, no, we don't handle that. Right. And you, you find out people say they want to come to you. People buy me. They don't buy, uh, they don't buy the services that I offer. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, next well, time the, I do it, next time I do a video interview, I might put on a collared shirt. There you um, go. But like me, things. I mean, I'm just sitting here in my, you know, work clothes and I feel yeah, like well, I get dressed up, but you know, yeah. hey, it's you and me, it's Warren and Brian. Well, yeah, we, and we stick this on to the, to the end when anybody who cares about that is already tuned out and, right. and say that, you know, this was recorded as, uh, we decided we'd do video instead of audio and who cares? You know? That's right. 
Yeah, I mean, they're just listening to two talking heads anyway. So the other piece of this toilet paper math is the difference between the consumer mindset and the business mindset. And one of the things that you really have to do is think about who you're communicating to and what messages they want and need to hear. And one of the situations I see is smaller, mid-sized companies that don't know how to fill in the gaps. You know, marketing is an ecosystem, especially online marketing. The way I look at it is, is that your content is the oxygen that grows the tree that makes the toilet paper. Okay, so your content is the thing that basically takes years and years and years and years and years to grow into something that you could finally make useful. And that content can constantly be repurposed, recycled, it can be everything. So, but you as the business owner have to get into the mindset of which are my perfect customers, who are my best customers, what do they like, what don't they like, and what do they need to hear? Now, the common mistake I see people making is, Number one, they go to a seminar or webinar or whatever, and they hear, we need to do social media. So they walk up to the receptionist, and she's 20 years old, and go, you know how to tweet. You are now our social media person. The mm -hmm. problem is that person has never been trained on how to write communication. They're probably tweeting from a 20-year-old's perspective when your clients are 50 years old. And thirdly, they have no concept on how to measure any of those results. They're just out there posting things, hoping that it's going to stick to the wall. So then that's number one. The next thing that happens is, okay, let's hire a real marketing person. So they bring in a marketing person. Well, which marketing person are you going to get? Are you going to get the IT person who could build a website? Are you going to get the writer person who can write the content? Are you going to get the email marketing person who understands how to utilize that technology? Are you going to get the social media person? Or are you hoping for that savant who can do all of those things at the same time? Chances of finding that pe person is one in a million, and chances are they're working for your competitor. So you have to start thinking about holistically what is your strategy? What do you want to do? When do you want to do it? What do your customers need to hear? And then how do I fill in the gaps? so that I make sure I have this holistic approach to be able to communicate those messages. Sure, I'll put a little bit, I, you know, I, I listen to that and going like, should I brag that I'm a savant? No, I've been doing it for 40 years. <laughs> uh, so I've been online since most, most of the people who call themselves experts were born. Right. Um, yeah, so, uh, but that doesn't mean me, that I'm the guy to hire to build your website. It means that you need the strategy. You need somebody who's thinking about the marketing, the strategy, all of this sort of thing, uh, the psychology of it all, mm -hmm. and then it comes up with a plan, and then you've got tasks. Getting those tasks implemented becomes a more or less a management kind of thing. Be great if you get somebody who's an expert in one of those, one of those things to work on it, but uh, quite often I see they bring in the, the CMO or the director of marketing, a new guy, and he's really good at this thing or the other. I had a conversation with somebody who had just just been brought in because of his email expertise, and you know, I was I was consulting, but I was not consulted on this. They brought this guy in, uh, so I go, great, let's have a phone conversation with him. I don't want a competitor. I want a friend. I want to, you know, just let's have a quick phone call. And we talk, and I say, well, you know, I they say you've done great things with email. I mean. You know, I, in my own list is only a couple hundred thousand. And <laughs> even though I, I'm part owner of a company that has eight million, but, you know, I just, eh, you know, it's just me and my own list I ever built. It goes like, well, that's way bigger than anything I ever did. And <laughs> I got that. And of course, I didn't hold that against him. He was a smart kid with mm -hmm. a lot of ideas. Uh, you know, then it became whether or not some, something was going to get implemented. And actually, in that case, he didn't implement Mm -hmm. And that's really what matters. It doesn't matter whether you have name brand experience, you've done the right things, you got the right certificate. And most of the people I talk to trying to make the decision, especially like social media, they're not using social media th themselves. They don't get it. Right. They, they say, well, our page has a post every day. And I go, yeah, but you have two likes. Um, you know, you got a million customers and nobody's going to your page because don't do that. Or your page is getting traffic because your name brand. 
I actually spoke with the, at a uh, local thing where there was casino people here in Vegas and somebody with a brand you would recognize, household brand, was on a panel with me. I've written books about social media. She was in her first job in doing social media, mm -hmm. but she had 4 million uh, people on the page back before they had groups and other things to measure on Facebook. So they're just measuring how many followers you had on the page. Well, it's a name brand, everybody knows. They come stay at the place, they come to Vegas, they click on the, on the resorts. She wasn't right. successful, the brand was successful. And parsing that out is what strategy is. So, um, you know, I don't know. I, just, uh, I, do, you, uh, do you call what you do marketing, marketing and brand strategy? Yeah, I mean, the way my business is built right now is normally I'll go in and I have a three-part process. And the first thing is I go in and evaluate exactly what a company is doing. And that's the first thing. One company hired me. They said, we're paying $100,000 a year. Tell us what the heck we're getting for $100,000. So I sat down and started to evaluate all the different bit parts, their right. website, their email, their social, their, you know, SEM, search engine marketing, paid advertising, you know, all of that stuff and put it into buckets and said, okay, now let's measure which, if any of these are getting you sales. And the question I asked them was, which one of these can you attribute to sales? And they said, none, we have no idea. And I said, mm -hmm. okay, well, that's where we're going to start is we're going to take away half of what you're doing and we're going to focus on three things. And now let's see if we can increase sales. And if mm -hmm. we can increase sales with those three things, then we can start adding on some other stuff again. Um, and when we took those things away, nothing changed. <laughs> Nothing, <laughs> you know, and then we started doing things, you know, improving the website, fixing broken links, um, you know, creating more social media posts from content that's already sitting on the website. I mean, most people, when they create a blog post, they put the blog post up and they put it on social once and they let it go. I had one company I worked with that had one particular post in their website that was the parts of a tractor. This company did not make tractor parts. They had nothing to do with it. They outsourced parts to China, but they had nothing to do with tractors. But it was mm -hmm. the most important page on their website. It got more hits than their homepage. And I mm -hmm. said, why did you put that up there? They say, we don't know. Okay, do you realize this is getting more hits than anything? What are you doing to collect names and data from that page? Nothing. Do people just hit it? Okay, well, let's put a graphic on there for a free ebook download or maybe a box of chocolate, whatever it is. And when they click on it, you can at least collect the names of people that are coming to that page and give them something in return. Wow, that's brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> Did they ever execute that? No, <laughs> you know, but it's, it's knowing what to look for and figure it right. out. So strategy first, then create a plan, then implement the plan. And the thing I've done is I've grown my team currently to 10 people and they all specialize in different things. One's an ebook creator, one's a blog writer, one's a website content creator, one's a PR person, one's a graphic designer, one's a, a web page developer, one's a deep level data programmer. I mean, all these people and the cool thing is you basically you know, bring them in and out like you do on a basketball game. When you need a point guard, you bring in the point guard. When you don't need a point guard, you take them out. You don't necessarily have to have five people on the court. You can have none. You can have one. You can have 10. You know, it just depends on what the needs are. So it actually gives me the ability to scale and mold based on what the client's looking to accomplish. And right. of course, I can take them and use them so, across multiple companies. So uh, normally people in, in the realm of what you do and I do, are troubled and asked for by customers to give what are the what are the deliverables you can give mm -hmm. but the insight and uh, in the way you put it is brilliant today because Thanks. it sounds more like what brand strategy sounds like when you get to somebody who actually does brand strategy right. like you know that the the head of uh of an ad agency uh and a friend that i was just talking to about this um and you know he doesn't mess with doing anything he won't write the copy, right. you know. Uh, he knows how to do some of these things, but he doesn't. He does brand strategy. He's worked a lot more as a brand strategy. Mm -hmm. Well, in somebody that has a budget of several million, it makes sense to get some 
anybody on your team like that. But right. the concepts, the way you explain it, somebody that's got a hundred thousand dollar budget should be hiring a brand strategy at the very least, at uh, least. for for a, a short term engagement. And the need is so huge; it's easy to see the mm -hmm. um, <laughs> the 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 desire of people to buy brand strategy rather than something else. So I, anyway, my, in this discussion, we were talking about doing some business together. It's an old friend. And uh, that what came up was, well, maybe it's the way that I meet people and the way I introduce it. People say, what do I do? Well, I'm not really sure. That could be an answer. I'm an enigma. Uh, or this is what my current project is or blah, 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 talking about whatever, because I'm a storyteller. Mm -hmm. and make the connection and get things started and people want to do business with me but they're not really sure what uh and so you know business has been good i've not been too focused on it of late but he really had me thinking if i went up to somebody and said well what is your brand strategy and you've done it in a different way you ask people you know how's your toilet paper working um, right. you know it's like well it's you know are you are you worrying about yourself or bacon which are right. questions that then get somebody and of course, this ought to be taken into everybody. I hope anyone listening would see this, that no matter what you're doing, you can present it in a way that'll get somebody's attention, get a conversation going. They realize you're brilliant. They want to hire you. Mm -hmm. the, the rest of the mechanics become simple. Well, and, and the bottom line is I don't advertise. And the cool thing is I have a waiting list and C, I actually interview my clients to make sure they're a good fit. And there's three components. Number one, they have to have a budget, okay? Mm -hmm. They have to have money, number right. two. And that's, and that's not just because uh, I'm greedy, it's because if they don't have money to spend, I can't do anything for them. Number right. two, they have to want to be involved. If they wanna hire somebody to do everything for them and not be involved, if I can't stick a USB cord in the back of their head and suck out their knowledge, I won't work with them because right. I can't be successful. It, unless I can tap into their brains because I can't, mm -hmm. you know, understand their brand and, and everything that they need to know. They really have acquired all the customers they have, even if the marketing is not working, right. something has attracted people and without having their involvement, you just can't get that. Right. And then the third piece is they have to be willing to experiment. And that means they have to oh, be, they one. cannot be so hard nosed to say, I, I had one customer came to me and said, I want to do SEO, I want to do SEO, I want to do SEO. And I said, well, okay, that's fine. You mm -hmm. know, if you want to do SEO, I've got an SEO guy. All right. Right. And I will point you to the SEO guy and you two go have a great relationship together, but you're not going to work with me because I want to do content marketing and email marketing. Well, we do email marketing. We have MailChimp. Okay, great. Um, how is your list segmented? Well, it's not. Okay. So you're sending the same email to a floor manager at a store and the CEO of companies. Right. Yeah. Okay. Well, do you, know, do you understand the difference? This guy is trying to you know, get a bonus. This one's trying not to get fired. Um, you're dealing with different mindsets. You can't send the same message to the same person. What do you mean? Okay. You know, so if they're not willing to listen and and try things and at least give it a little bit of time you know have i failed yes and and normally when i fail it's because the client will not execute or try long enough what i tell them to do it's right well and, and failure is just data uh, right. so if you don't experiment you're not gonna get any failures but you know i i keep hearing this now i think this is the third time you've given us a list of three things Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and it's something I do on a regular basis, try to summarize and say this and that, or this, that, and the other thing, uh, keep it down and simple, some steps to take. Um, and that's a, a brilliance. Uh, you have obviously writing books and courses and things like that. You've come up with the, the steps to that. Mm -hmm. Um, are you stuck on three or is that just, no, I'm not stuck on three. I'll do a list of five or 10. But my wife always taught me that when you're planting things, always plan them in three in odd numbers. So plan them in threes, plan them in fives, plan them in seven. So that's always stuck with right. me. Because you have an odd number of kids? Uh, no, we have two. <laughs> <laughs> so, but if you had the dog in, that would have been three. Uh, uh, it would have been three. Yeah. Well, right. that's a, it's easier to get a dog. Yeah, <laughs> it is a lot easier to get a dog. I know, I'm not sure about cheaper sometimes, but. Yeah, easier. that's true. That's true. Uh, but, 
But one of the, th you know, all of this stuff that we're talking about are things that I've learned since I've written the first book by going into conferences and talking to these marketing gurus. Okay. Right. And, you know, I love them all and they all are very good. But one person says email marketing is the only way. And one says that video is the only way and SEO right. is the only way. And the one thing that I found is when you're dealing with an audience and this is the probably the most important thing i've ever learned and this is in the in the preface of my book is when i was a kid i was an auditory learner all right there are three kinds of learners we're getting back to the threes there's a visual learner an auditory mm -hmm. learner and a tactile learner i could sit in class and i could listen to things and jot down notes and learn a ton of stuff but i sucked at tests why because I had to go home and read from a book and memorize what was in the book. If I had an audio cassette of what the teacher was saying, I would have passed all the tests. But because I had to read the book, I sucked at tests. So one of the things that you have to realize as a marketer is there are people out there that want to listen to your stuff, people that want to read your stuff, and people that want to touch your stuff. Now that can get a little personal. I don't recommend it, especially in the Me Too world. But you know, you have to decide, and it could be the toilet paper. Don't squeeze the Charmin. Remember that. Right. Um, so the key thing that you have to do is you have to deliver content on multiple platforms to multiple people and measure what's working. Because some people want to consume video, some people want to consume print, sure. some people want to consume audio. You know. All well, of some those of the, things have to be yeah. done together. Some of the best guys, I think a conference you were at, a guy was talking about video and he just had a huge viral hit and mm -hmm. gotten very good at making videos. And yeah. the guy was right to say you can do very well with video. Yeah. Uh, but in those presentations, they tend to say, well, you've tried email and it didn't work. Because yeah, because most people doing marketing have tried seven different things and, and failed. However, right. One thing I could tell you in my 40 years experience of doing this, no, the medium doesn't fail. <laughs> right. Something else fails. It's how you used it. Did you buy cheap radio ads because they played from two to three in the morning and you're trying to reach um, busy mothers? You know, it's like, right. why, you know, uh, did you, did you go on the wrong format? I, I once sold a, um, a insisting by, by the client, sold a Wolfman Jack package Saturday mm -hmm. night on a radio station uh, to a guy that was Dennis for children. Hmm. Now he was correct in saying that the parents make the decision. The parents were of the right age, like Wolfman Jack back in the eighties. And I go, that makes some sense, but that's not a marketing strategy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's right. That's a good deal because you happen to really like Wolfman Jack. And in the package, Wolfman Jack read the, read the commercial. Um, good sale went fine. I really liked the guy, liked what he had to do in his business. Uh, a couple other things I won't get into that, but uh, everything about him I really liked. But the ads were a disaster because, first of all, he didn't like what the way Wolfman said something. Well, you don't go to Wolfman and tell him how to how to read something. He's <laughs> the you know most famous disc jockey ever, um, right. and uh, and so you just couldn't couldn't do that. And so they tr you know we tried that, and then. You know, they've tried it for a month and decided, well, we'll maybe tr pick it up and try it again sometime. Mm -hmm. And yeah, the phone didn't ring. There was no call to action. There was, you know, again, I was the, just the salesman on this on this gig. But, uh, you know, I learned over and over again. I'm glad I started my career with a bunch of that, of, 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 of working with small businesses that, right. uh, that really said word of mouth is how they got customers. That, you know, we've tried everything. We've got to be in the phone book. And I said, that has nothing to do with actually, you know, marketing your business. What you, yeah, the phone book guy came, came along, you signed a contract, and now you, that can't be your marketing budget. We have to do something more. Exactly. But, uh, boy, yeah. big, thing, big thing I learned many years ago, but not, not that many. I wish I'd learned a lot before. Doesn't matter how nice the person is, unless they have a budget and they're willing to spend it, you're screwed. Right. And, um, and the other thing that you just said, which is very important, is they have to be willing to get out of their own way because he liked Wolfman Jack. He wanted to put his thing on Wolfman Jack. Well, exactly. You know, the bottom line is if that's not where your audience is. And I see this all the time is I like video. I want to do video. But if your audience and, and it goes back to that 20 year old, if, if the 20 year old is into Instagram 
and you're trying to reach 50 year olds in a professional scene and they're all on LinkedIn, you can put all the Instagram you want out there all day long and, and nobody will see it. Who's interested in purchasing your product. Right. So, well, and as a, as a B2B play, the CEO could make one phone call to the right person, make a mm -hmm. connection that may change the whole course of the company. Right. And that's usually what they end up doing because the marketing is not working. And they'll tell you the marketing doesn't work. Uh, other favorite story is somebody decided to try direct mail. Mm -hmm. So they designed a postcard, bought a mailing list, and mailed it out. Parts of that, as he told the story, made sense. So what didn't make sense, he says, I tried direct mail and it just does not work. Okay. And it turned out that after this was at a dinner of a lot of people in the same business as me, turns out that when we, when we, we finally, one of them was able to get a copy of the postcard and show it to me, it was the worst looking postcard ever. The guy was trying to, he was trying to do a, a like a busy phone book ad, you know, we do everything right. and put her on this and then kind of a, like, keep this card handy. If you need me, no call to action, no special. Uh, anything like that. But the guy had proven that direct mail didn't work. Well, I've done mailings, gosh, hundreds of times for, for my for my brick and mortar business of different things we designed. And there's only one that, that didn't really have an ROI of, of at least paying for itself. Mm -hmm. When websites were new in the 90s, I tried putting a website on a postcard by itself. That did not work. There just were not enough people. There wasn't any call to action. There wasn't but, enough. But the web was new, there, and I tried people, that. None of people on AOL at the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it's uh, it, it, you know, it it was uh, a failure that taught me something. You know, I spent a hundred bucks, but so many times I tried something and it sort of worked. Uh, today I see a lot of people trying uh, PPC. Uh, you know, buying ads on AdWords and and wind up they spend a lot of money and then many times i've seen this where it ends up going to a, a page not found oh yeah and you've got traffic and or, why not fix the traffic you've got or even why go out and that, try to buy some more a 404 page is bad yeah. sending somebody to your home page when you're selling a specific thing is worse yeah <laughs> uh i gotta say Blowing the entire amount immediately no, I'm, I'm probably teasing. does beat. Go no, if they no, go to the you, homepage, at least they might know who you are. Well, they uh, know who you are, but the problem is, and you're making them hunt down what it is that they're looking for, and they get frustrated. You know, they get you're gonna get that's a poor, poor lead to get there. right. A 404, at least they've gotten to your website and they realize it could be an error and they might come back. But if you but they might go looking for what they want, exactly. they might give you a call to tell you you've got the error, exactly. I but used to be of the opinion that anybody told me about, you know, you got a spelling error. Ah, you idiot. I want to leave, you know, you don't, you didn't get my message. You've got my spelling error. I've changed. It used to be when I had a brick and mortar, mm -hmm. somebody comes in the front door and asks for me. First thing I trained people working for me was what mm -hmm. to do when somebody comes in the front door and calls and asks for warrant. <laughs> it's like, here are the steps, you know, but right. it's not my family or somebody, you know, I talk to all the time. Don't put the call through. Ask right. them a couple of more questions. And well, sure enough, I had people that got very good at that and sold more than I would have because I was busy and they weren't. Well, but, here's the, um, here's the but thing. But then I learned that with the with the internet, I can tell everybody, go ahead, send me an email. I'll get it. Right. I may not be able to spend a lot of time working on it, especially if you're asking me for a favor and and for, you know, <laughs> give money to this cause I've never heard of. There's a few things I just turned down, but uh, but for the most part, I find we now can handle that kind of communication come in. So when I was back in a brick and mortar, I'd probably be spending a couple hours a day sitting in the front lobby talking to people that walk in the door. Mm -hmm. Well, and I built a brand about exactly what you talked about. My nickname is Captain Typo. Mm -hmm. And I actually have a I actually have a avatar, Captain Typo, with a big T on his chest and the cape. Right. Nine yards. Of course you do. And um, so what I've done, even with my book, is I took chapter one, you know, I took the preface and I took chapter one and I threw it up on Facebook. And I said, it's going to have typos. It's going to give anybody who's a, a grammar police or a grammar Nazi, it's a kind of an un, 
PC term nowadays, but still use, but a grammar police, it's going to give you heebie-jeebies because it sucks. I didn't proof it. I didn't do any of those things. There's typos, you're, 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 we're, you know, all those things are bad. But the thing is, is that people read it. They want to correct it, you know, because they know that they just, they get it in their head and then they comment on it and they offer me suggestions and ideas. Hey, I really like this toilet paper idea. Here's another thing that you could do. One of the guys said, um, he said that uh, he quoted me on one thing today. He says, uh, life is like toilet paper. Um, the closer you get to the end, the faster it goes. <laughs> okay. When it comes to the roll of toilet paper. And I thought that's brilliant. I'm going to use that in the book. Just by putting it out there, you're crowdsourcing. You're getting your audience to engage. They're giving you feedback and ideas. You're getting editor quality stuff instead of a proofreader who's not going to pay attention to what they're reading. Exactly. Right. So yeah, you know, a lot more comprehension coming from it. Uh, on Twitter Revolution, we we gave away thirty five hundred copies before mm -hmm. uh, before it went. we it actually had another name on it. There was a contest in planning on that, and um, um, you know, and so we decided to, we decided to go with the name that I had from the beginning, Twitter mm -hmm. Revolution. Uh, one of the discussions we had was to call a social media revolution because we were so early in that. I said, no, I got to be the first Twitter book. Yep. And we did that. And today I can still say, and forever we'll be able to say, I had the first book that came out on the subject of Twitter. Sales of the book didn't really matter as much as getting people into that process. We right. had hundreds of people uh, send in information that we put in as tweets. Uh, we had lots of correction and ideas on that. Uh, also found out that, uh, you know, one famous friend had not got mentioned in the book. Uh, you know, you know, he picked, he was one of the early copies. I, <laughs> I uh, gave him, I don't think I sold it, I gave it to him. And he said, hey, I'm not in the book. Show me where I'm in the book. Um, and so we reprinted, we put him in the book. Mm -hmm. um, everything we could. And that got more pull than selling books. Yep. And I just moved. I know I have two cases of Twitter revolution left <laughs> from when it became a bestseller and was uh, in 2009, went crazy. They reordered, you know, as much as we'd ever sold. And, uh, and then of course, a lot of those came back or wound up in a warehouse where I said, I'm not paying for the, the storage or the shipping, you can get rid of them. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so the, the publishing business, the actual book, not, a, not that great of a business. Well, uh, yeah, publishing works on whatever scale the big, the big New York people do it and some other ones make some money off of the, selling, you know, hundreds of thousands of copies of fiction yep. and business is a business card. Um, and, uh, so you're getting a new business card. Are you? Well, that's exactly what I'm doing. I'm going to spend Perfect. probably every time I write a book, it costs me around $5,000. Okay. Right. But the key thing is I don't care how many books I sell. It's the 10 people who I put that book into their hand, who read it, who end up hiring me to do a hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, now, now you now we could go into stories for the rest of the day, but let's. Not. <laughs> but that's the point. The point. I of told the book somebody is that all I told that. somebody that everything they did didn't matter. They were paying me to make their book a bestseller. We sold a lot of copies, and we did. But the main thing is, she was going for eight-figure deals, and I said you should send this to each one of the top hundred prospects. Uh, you can't have it hand delivered. Have the best, you know, FedEx, whatever to get it mm -hmm. to them so they'll know how important it was that they got this. And maybe one of those, it'll move ahead a deal and be part of what makes you make the deal. But one of those deals would take care of it, would right. spend for everything she was doing. And I, she went off to do that. I was hired to promote the book on Amazon. Uh, anyway, uh, let's wrap it up. Where can we yeah. find out more about the book? Well, the book is going to be on Amazon. It is still in progress. I don't even have a cover yet, but if they want to go find me, just go to Google, go to the Google machine, type in Brian Basilico, B-R-I-A-N-B-A-S-I-L-I-C-O, and you will find everything. You'll find my Facebook, my Twitter. You can read some of the chapters. If you friend me on Facebook, you can read a couple of the chapters up there. Uh, I will be, after I get the first section done, I'm getting it in front of an editor. I'm going to get that and give that section away. 
And Good. as I start to write the rest of it, I'm going to turn it into an ebook. Everybody can have the first section for free. So if you follow me, you'll find out about that and I'll end up giving you the first piece of it. So that's, uh, that's pretty much it. I'll give you one what? last quickie story. And one of the best salesman ideas I've ever heard was a guy who was trying to get his foot in the door, literally, with female executives. And what he did is he would go out and he would buy an extremely expensive pair of shoes. And he would actually research. He would get a hold of their executive assistant, figure out the color they liked, the size they liked. He would get a, a delivery man to deliver a box. Inside that box was one shoe and a note that says, I would like to meet with you. If you want the other shoe, please give me a call. <laughs> it's a great story. Uh, mm -hmm. I've heard other ones that, uh, that uh, show, uh, sometimes these can get a little bit on the creepy side. Uh, the mm -hmm. shoe one sounds nice. You do okay with that. The uh, uh, perfumed elevator, a perfumed envelope to get past the receptionist. So it'll be a private and handed to the, the prospect you want. Right. All sorts of problems that they could come <laughs> But the innovation, the thinking, the creativity of this is the right direction. Right. Um, so yeah, it's not like go take, go do the shoe thing. Just <laughs> figure right. out what it is that's going to attract that person. And I'll give you one that I know is universally good. Find out what they're interested in, say charity or sport or whatever, but a charity is the best. And then, you know, see how you can contribute to that. Do Especially a if it's one, in their name and send it to them. Yeah. Absolutely. Or if it's a vector that you can, uh, that you can talk to them about. If mm -hmm. what they really want to do is get better at, uh, you know, whatever their, their kids going through and they don't know what, you know, where to get a better coach or tutor. And you happen to know that you can help them. Um, if it's something they care, if they like to arrange flowers and that's your hobby, well, that's what you should be talking to him about. The mm -hmm. interesting thing about that, uh, Robert Cialdini points out when he, when he speaks, or I interviewed him a couple of times, uh, the influence guy. I love uh, He said, uh, you know, in his rule, his law of, um, of uh, which one was it, um, likability, mm -hmm. that many people think, a salesman thinks that, well, that I got to be likable. I got to go in and I do this naturally. It's wrong. You start talking about toilet paper, I have to tell you a toilet paper story. Mm -hmm. If you're playing golf, you say, well, I just played golf. No. If the guy cares about golf, you want him talking about golf. Right. And you want him liking. You Likeability means you need to like that person for who they are mm -hmm. uh, rather than getting them to like you. And once I turned that around, really helped. Uh, because imagine me without knowing that. So I still do it a whole lot. I have a story about everything. I'm point. sure you do. And that's why it comes I love in handy for man. podcasts. Um, <laughs> good. Well, let's wrap again, it up man. by Warren, Warren Whitlock, uh, warrenwhitlock.com or wherever you found this is probably attached some tag to me and I'll make sure to share Brian and keep introducing uh, you to people. And uh, it's a great relationship. I'll talk to you on uh, the next time I'm on the bacon podcast. One last word. Vegan. Yeah.